Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Nathan Moore. I'm with Wright Medical's uh, Total Ankle Marketing Team. Uh, welcome to the next installment of what we're now calling the FAST program, which stands for the, right, uh, the Frank Wright Ankle Specialist Training Program. So as a marketing guy, I felt like it was time to come up with a name that was a little catchier and FAST program seems to roll off the tongue a little bit easier than advanced TAR specialist program. So I felt like we're going the right direction there. So uh, thank you again for your willingness uh, to be part of our inaugural group of attendees as well as your flexibility as we continue to move through this COVID situation and, and get uh, you know, a little more experience with these webinars. Uh, but with that said, you know our hope is certainly at some point next year, the environment will be such that uh, we're able to arrange some of our originally planned activities, like whether to be OR visits or dinners, even a, possibly a single day didactic course or even a combination. But uh, in the near term, you know, we'll continue to plow ahead uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get some good news as we go into next year. So uh, tonight's focus uh, is going to be part one of two uh, that we're going to be focusing on complex primaries. Uh, will be uh, the follow-up to this will be part two naturally it will be in October and we'll be uh, have another uh, faculty member providing some additional perspectives on things like coronal deformity uh, addressing the foot infection and, and many other topics so and then in December our hope is that we can uh, you know make scheduling work for everyone early early December ideally and we would do a uh, you know a talk on revisions and, and even get into uh, multi-stage procedures as well as talk about some things like, you know, the business side, whether it be, you know, uh, expanding guitar practice, driving patient awareness and those types of things. So, uh, and obviously a lot of opportunity for Q&A uh, as well. So real quick, just a couple of Zoom housekeeping notes. Number one, uh, we invite all of our surgeon attendees who have now been, uh, who have now been uh, promoted to panelists, it looks like. Uh, that you are all welcome to interact as we go along. Just be sure to turn your camera on. And, uh, and also unmute your mic if you do have a question. We do have a Q&A box as well that you can use, but certainly, you know, there's a small enough group here where if you guys want to just uh, chime in, certainly feel free to do that. Uh, we want this to be as interactive as possible. And, and also just note that this is being uh, recorded. So uh, this is something we may use in our, our virtual learning center uh, down the road. So before I pass it over to Dr. Davis, who's going to introduce our speaker and the topic for tonight, uh, it's been a little while since we got together, so I figured I would just kind of run through our, our different attendees here, just kind of introduce everybody. So I'm just going to go in alphabetical order. So it looks like tonight we've got uh, Dr. Uh, Jeremy Adams out of uh, Oxford, Mississippi, uh, Dr. Adam Bitterman out of Huntington, Huntington uh, New York, uh, Dr. Ryan Callahan from Twin Falls, Idaho, uh, Dr. James Lackman from Quaker Down, Quakertown, Pennsylvania, Dr. LaRoe. Uh, Craig LaRoe from Springfield, uh, Massachusetts, Dr. Michael Lee from Spartanburg, South Carolina, Dr. Patrick Maloney from Baltimore, Maryland, Dr. Aaron Mates from Trinity, Florida, and Dr. Jason Patterson from Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and Dr. Greg Scallon from uh, Richland, Washington, and uh, Dr. Brian Staginski from uh, Columbus, Ohio. So thanks again to all of you for joining us this evening. And with that, I'll pass it to Dr. Davis. All right, uh, Nate, thank you uh, so much. It's, it's always um, exciting for me to uh, be on a program with my good friend, Murray Penner. Um, and I'm gonna change my background. I, I'm actually in Sun Valley, Idaho, um, which is why it looks like I'm, I'm so relaxed. Um, but uh, our goal with this program is uh, to introduce uh, the inaugural group into as many uh, talented and uh, smart arthroplasty surgeons as we can. And uh, when that list comes up, uh, at the top of the list is our, always Murray. Uh, Murray has been, um, been super influential in uh, the design process with Wright Medical as well as um, has been a leader in the Canadian Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society and all of the seminal work that they have done um, in defining the demographics of uh, ankle arthritis. So, um, so I, am, I am so glad to carry Murray's clubs here and, uh, <laughs> and I'll be here uh, to uh, both listen and, uh, and to maybe facilitate some conversation. Murray, you will thoroughly enjoy this group. These are, these are super smart, 
uh, focused guys who um, who are right up your alley. So Murray. Perfect. Well, thank you, Hodges. That's uh, really kind of you, and I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be a part of this. Uh, this, this group, this is, this is exactly the way that I love to uh, be involved with, with teaching and with learning and you know, in small groups, I think in scenarios where you can kind of talk to people back and forth, share some dialogue, hopefully kind of get a sense of whether the person you're listening to is actually believable or not, and, and ideally be able to interact in a way and, and challenge and then learn all together. Uh, Janice, Nate, thanks for organizing this. Uh, it's, it's a real treat. And uh, I'm coming to you guys from Vancouver here across a bit of a border, but we all are in the soup here together. So it's, uh, it's, it's great to be able to interact this way, even though it's maybe not quite as good as in person. Um, the topic I was sort of asked to, to speak a bit about and today is it's, it's kind of a large topic. It was meant to be around uh, primary ankle replacement, but kind of from the perspective of maybe sharing how it is or you know, what, what's my perspective on ankle replacement? How does it fit into my practice? Now, what do I do? How do I look at it? And then how did I get here? And so I've been doing this for about 20 years and it, it struck me that trying to summarize all of that and, and you know, to, to fit into 20 or 30 minutes of, of some talking and then giving some time for discussion that that was gonna be a bit challenging. So you're certainly not gonna get every last little uh, <laughs> truism that I think exists in ankle replacement, but uh, I'll try to share with you some of the things that I think are at least worth thinking about and uh, how I think about them. You can challenge me on any of these things, of course. And then uh, we'll have a, a handful of cases at the end that I hope will be open and interactive with uh, lots of engagement. Um, so here we go. I've been at this for 20 years and uh, it's been an interesting 20 to say the least. I'm gonna just share my screen here now if I can get that button going and uh, do let me know if you're not seeing what you're supposed to see. So I, I think, uh, Maybe somebody just give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides there and we're just gonna get going. So 20 years of ankle replacement, you know, how did I get to this point? Well, these are my views. The outline today is pretty straightforward. I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about how I currently use ankle replacement in my practice. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how I got here and uh, for any of you paying attention to the pictures on the right, you have sort of betraying my age at this point already. So it's 2020 where we are now. And the question is, you know, how do I approach some of these things? And I could have put up a very long list of variables that I think are important to think about in ankle replacement, but I picked these handful because I think these represent some of the most important ones, or at least they're the ones that I get asked about a lot, uh, kind of how I think about it. And so we'll touch on these and then move on. So getting right to it, the first of these and the one that kind of comes up almost more than anything else is age, age and ankle replacement. How, how do I think about this and how do I think others should think about this? Well, what do I use as my guide when I'm thinking about age and ankle replacement? I think about this word, salvageability, which is a funny word, and why would that matter? Well, when you think a bit about it, here's a case example. Here's a patient, this is a, oh, this is a real case of mine, a 49-year-old guy, he's had an ankle fusion uh, and a subtalar fusion, they were done sequentially, but he's now left with this effective TTC fusion, and he's now got considerable talonavicular joint pain, it gets better with blocks, and he's finally fed up with this, and Ultimately, how can you salvage this situation? So he's got a failed ankle fusion. Well, this is a relatively easy salvage to a total ankle, a takedown total ankle. And here he is four years out doing very well, uh, very happy with his outcome. Contrast that to this, another patient similar age who's had an ankle replacement done by me in a rheum severe rheumatoid scenario, and it's clearly gone to hell. And how are you gonna salvage that? And for somebody like this, there's really almost no salvage at all. She's got an equally bad looking ankle without an ankle replacement in it on the other side. So we can't just do her an amputation and things. She's left with this as her only real salvage. And so where, you know, where are we at with that? Well, the difference here is bone stock. And so when you think about failed ankle fusions, these generally leave people with some bone stock and that means you've got some options for salvage. So I think of it this way, in patients who are at an increased lifetime risk for failure, meaning that over the course of their, hopefully a good long life, they, ex they will experience a failure of whatever choice of reconstruction I make, I tend to prefer ankle fusion. So who are these patients? Well, think about this. The, you know, the Hinterman's group showed us many years ago now that in patients less than age 70, they were significantly at increased risk for uh, a need of revision. When we look at survivorship of implants down, you know, in 15 years, maybe 50% or a little bit better, uh, depending on which device we're looking at. What this tells us is that if you do anchor replacements in patients below the age of 55 or 60, 
they're going to be at very high risk of needing at least one revision. But if you drift much below that, you're looking at patients who will likely need two or three revisions in their lifetime. And that means they need to be salvageable. And so what can we conclude? Well, in the young patient, that salvageability is going to be really critical. And they're going to be at high lifetime risk of, of failure. They need that salvage option. And salvage options are greater in ankle fusion because you've left them with bone stock. And so I look at ankle fusion as being a preferred out there, preferred reconstructive option for the very young patients. And I don't have a hard cutoff. Like I said, I think about it from that salvageability perspective. It's kind of a very thick, blurry line around the age of 50. And uh, it depends on so many other factors, but that's how the, the, the perspective I'd encourage you to take in looking at it. Don't have a hard number, a hard cutoff. Look at it from the perspective of how are you gonna salvage this when it all goes sideways? And here's a bit of an example of just how I applied that. This is a patient with uh, hemochromatosis, so bilateral ankle arthritis that you see here. He's 48 years old. And so in that scenario, what did I do? I did an arthroscopic ankle fusion and he was very happy with that. But six years on, he already was having considerable pain in his right ankle at the time he did that fusion. And his right ankle just got worse and worse and worse. And now, six years later, he was purposely holding off because he didn't really want two ankle fusions. And he was now age 54. Though he was very happy with his left ankle fusion, he really didn't want that. And so we went ahead and did an ankle replacement now that he's 54 years old on his right-hand side. And so this is what he's like now. He's got a fusion on one side that he's happy with, a replacement on the other side that he's happy with but I'm playing the odds that we're going to get enough longevity now out of this right-hand total ankle replacement that if we need to salvage that down the road, we can. And this ankle fusion, that's going to be a matter of pulling a couple of screws out and putting an ankle replacement in there when the time comes to do that. So that's kind of how I look at age. One of the other things that we get to or talk about a lot is diabetes and other comorbidities. And how do I think about that? Well, that should be an easy one, but diabetes isn't really a binary problem. There's many different forms and severities of it. When I look at this, these are kind of my rules of thumb. A patient, if they're going to consider an ankle replacement, they definitely need to have good sugar control. Hemoglobin A1C is below seven, really. They need to have normal vascularity and not just okay. They need to have strong pulses, no calcifications in their vessels. They need to have normal skin. And I think that's almost the most important one. No ulcers, of course, but no just vascular changes and really normal color is what I'm really looking for. Clearly no neuropathy. I, I don't really uh, venture into that at all. I think vibration sense is the test that I use in my practice and it needs to be normal. They also need to be highly compliant patients because they're gonna have a stormier course no matter what. And if you've got somebody that's already pushing your buttons a little bit before you get going, it's not gonna turn out well. And then they need to be old enough to likely never need a revision in my mind because that, they're, they're only gonna get medically worse and that revision is gonna be a problem uh, when they get to be quite elderly and diabetic. And so if you're reading between the lines here, maybe it's quite obvious that this is quite a rare idealistic patient. They do exist, but they're not very common. So here's an example of what I mean by that. This is a 78-year-old guy with ankle pain and instability. He was a former rugby player, but he's got diabetes. His hemoglobin A1C is typically running about 6.8, so that's okay maybe. He's got some spinal stenosis, though, and a mild drop foot on that side. He can still get around, but he certainly slaps his foot a little bit. <clears throat> he's also got a fairly flexible flat foot below this valgus ankle arthritis, but most notably, he's got decreased vibration sense. Uh, he's not, he doesn't feel like he's really numb, but he certainly has diminished vibration sense, and he doesn't have a DP pulse, and he's a pretty big guy. And even though that sounds like, well, that's not that bad, what did he get? In my practice, I just did this a week and a half ago. Uh, he got a valor nail and there was just no way in the world that in a 78 year old guy that with these combination of problems that I was ready to take a chance and doing a total ankle here. And so that's sort of an illustration of the common type of diabetic patient you see, but there are those exceptions and I will consider an ankle replacement for them, but it's really rare in my practice. How about weight? Weight's another question I get asked a lot more about my own perhaps, but more about patients. And that is, is there a cutoff? Is there a limit on this? Well, I learned a lot about that quite a while back. This is a patient from long ago in my practice. He's a 57-year-old guy at the time, back three years before I did his total ankle. Uh, he, uh, he had a, a fra tibia fracture that I fixed. It went on to non-union. We took the nail out and revised him with uh, plating, and that ultimately healed, but he had this ankle arthritis. So in 2003, he had a star ankle done when he was age 60. But as you notice from the top, he was six foot three, 300 pounds when this started. 
Uh, by the time that I got that ankle replacement in, he'd gained even more weight. And by the time, unfortunately, he passed away uh, about three years ago now, he was up to about 375 pounds. But the one thing he always told me was his ankle was not his problem. Uh, he was actually really happy with it. And when you look at these x-rays from th uh, 14 years out, they look fantastic uh, for a star ankle at that point in time. And what that told me was that really weight itself as an isolated issue isn't really something to get too worried about. And that goes along with the literature that's out there. I think you need to be very cautious with heavy patients, but heavy patients can have excellent outcomes. And Hinnerman's group again has shown that that's quite a while back, but I think that's still a very true statement. I think it's really about the other factors that may go along with their weight that you really want to think more about. Another factor I get asked a lot about is COFAS type. And for those of you who may or may don't have it sort of in the front of your mind, the COFAS type is really divided into two types, complex and non-complex ankles, the non-complex being either no deformity or simple intraarticular deformities. And the complex types are more severe foot and tibial deformities or those with hind foot arthritis in the type fours. And without getting into too much of the literature around all of this and all the studies we've done within COFAS to look at this, what we can say that is that COFAS type one patients with minimal deformity, the difference between, in outcome between ankle replacement and arthroscopic fusion, this was just published uh, by Andy Velkovich in our group uh, in JBGS not too long ago, uh, is really the same. And the differences really are noticeable, most noticeable in COFAS types three and four. And so those patients that I steer directly towards an ankle replacement, and that might sound funny, they're the more complicated, difficult ones, but that's who really stands to benefit the most. And that doesn't mean a COFAS1 patient shouldn't have a total ankle. It just means that pushing them hard in that direction isn't really something that I personally do. I let them choose in those regards. But I think it's still important to then consider their age. They're really importantly their activity aspirations, their comorbidities and medical surgical risk, but then their deformity, stability, neurologic status and vascularity. And we're gonna come more to that. Here's just an example of that. A patient of mine, this is from two weeks ago now, I think, and uh, he's 63 years old, post-traumatic arthritis, as you can see here, clearly has some significant tail and avicular arthritis and some subtalar arthritis. But these patients now, I, I happily talk to them about ankle replacement. By the way, digging that hardware, there was an absolute nightmare. But nevertheless, we did. We put some prophylactic fixation into his medial malleolus and put in an ankle replacement without difficulty. And you'll notice that I didn't do anything to his hind foot. We got his ankle moving well enough that I really do believe, and it's, this is borne out in my practice, and I think Hodges would agree, that hind foot arthritis symptoms really seem to be diminished significantly if you can get the ankle working well. That doesn't mean they always go away completely and have I ever had to go back to, uh, to do a subtalar fusion? Yeah, once, exactly once. Uh, so it's pretty uncommon. So I tend to, even these Colfast type fours, I don't inherently jump on their subtalar or talonavicular joint unless it's really, really critical or clear that you're going to need that. Another question I get asked a lot about is implant type. How do I choose between in infinity and in-bone? That's a big topic in and of itself. But I look at it this way. Whenever a primary ankle replacement is an indicated operation and, and this is a clear and, deformity is relatively minimal and can be predictably fully corrected in your hands or in mine, then and their bone quality is within normal range, that's when they are going to get an infinity. When don't I use an infinity? Well, there's a bunch of scenarios. Bone quality is a real big one for me. So if they have rheumatoid arthritis like this with just ghostly bone, that's gonna get a, an in bone, a stemmed implant to distribute those loads. Or if they have poor bone quality because of a previous pilon fracture with potentially AVN of the distal tibia, that's also gonna get an in bone like you see here. And age and gender and AVN play into that a little bit as well. Also, if they have very significant deformity, so in varus, like you see here, if it's severe, like you see here, I think there is definitely an increased risk of <clears throat> uh, some degree of recurrence of deformity, or at the very least of edge loading. And I think a more robust implant uh, interface is important. And there I'm gonna use an, an in bone and a stemmed implant as well. And then for me, just about any valgus. So anybody with kind of valgus that you can really see uh, or especially those who are deltoid insufficient, those are all going to get an inbound again for that very same reason, the risk of recurrence and the risk of edge loading. I think that's much harder to reliably uh, fix in a valgus type of situation. But for all others, they're going to get an infinity like you see here. And then deformity is another big one. And we're going to talk about these things much more detail when we get to the cases. So I don't have a lot right here uh, to go through. 
but a little bit about varus. Well, I think varus is definitely much easier than valgus to treat, and I really don't have an upper limit on the amount of deformity that I'm willing to take on. Uh, just about anything is, is, is correctable if you take your time. Most of these are amenable to one stage correction as well, but I think there are scenarios, particularly around the severe cable varus feet that accompany some of these varus ankles, that two stage is really important. And then on top of that, uh, over the years, I've relearned, we're gonna come to this in the cases, be aware of the Z deformity ankle. So here's a big long list, don't even bother looking at this, but this is kind of how I've in my mind uh, sort of worked the process of going through the varus ankle, and we're gonna to touch on this when we get to the cases. What about valgus? Well, I find valgus much more challenging than varus. I think there are many more factors to consider. Uh, valgus is sort of a soft tissue tensile failure problem, whereas varus is really just a bone stacking problem. That's much easier to figure out. Rule out, I, I think in my practice, I rule out ankle replacement if the deltoid ligament is insufficient. And then I put in there, unless, and that is unless you or I can confidently reconstruct in a robust way the deltoid ligament because that tensile load is now gonna go onto that reconstruction and you have to be very confident in that. But if you can do that, then I think a valgus uh, realignment, valgus total length is a very reasonable thing to do. But if that's not part of your practice, then I would suggest that uh, deltoid insufficiency should rule out ankle replacement. I'm not gonna go through this in great detail, but I want to, this is just to, to tell you that I like to sort of think about the valgus in particular, right from, you know, from uh, hips to feet, not that you should do that for all of them, but really more so even for the ankle, or sorry, for the valgus ankle. And I'll just kind of give you an example of what I mean. This is a mild valgus case, 62 year old female carpenter. She injured her ankle at work 25 years prior likely had this high ankle sprain and went on to develop a valgus ankle arthritis. <clears throat> this is kind of my process. So look at the overall patient. For her, she had no limiting factor, so I can do whatever I want. She has a leg that has no deformity, but does have a tight gastroc, so that's going to get a gastroc lengthening. When I look at her ankle level, she's got good quality bone, so I'm not forced to think about a stemmed implant there. Her syndesmosis was slightly wide and perhaps not, quite, but not necessarily stable. If you look at these x-rays, you'll see what I'm getting at there. It's not gross, but it's a little wide. So I'm thinking to myself, be prepared to fuse the syndesmosis if it turns out to be unstable at the time of surgery. Her malleoli look normal, so I don't really have to think about osteotomies. There's no real wearing and that sort of thing. She doesn't have gross ligamentous laxity, so I don't expect I'm going to have to do a lot of ligamentous stab stabilization. And when I look at the type and the severity of her valve, she has this lateral wear pattern that's mild, meaning that her deltoid must be intact. So I don't have to plan a deltoid reconstruction. And since this is post-traumatic, she doesn't really have a lot of foot deformity, so I don't really need to think about a foot reconstruction. So I walk myself through all of those steps and sort of think about the impact of each one and then go ahead and her, her particular case got a very straightforward uh, total ankle, which where it has worked out really well for her in the long run. So that's just how I think about that. And then lastly, what about tibial deformity? Well, if tibial deformity is mild, I like to think I can accommodate that within the cuts of the ankle replacement. But usually if, uh, if you're planning, if you're, you can usually only do this if you're planning to use a non-stemmed implant because you change the, or the, you develop a deviation between the anatomic axis of the tibia, which the stem has to follow, and the mechanical axis, which is what you'd ideally want to follow. So if the deformity is moderate or severe in the tibia, or if you're planning to use a stemmed implant, then you must correct the deformity. Also, if the patient's very young and you want to maximize longevity and optimize mechanics, I think it's really important as well. But this just illustrates that latter point. You can see this patient's got a valgus, sorry, a varus tibial plafond with a varus distal tibial bow. And if I want to put a stemmed implant in here, for example, you can see that if I put it along the mechanical axis, it's going to sit in halfway through the fibula far too far laterally. But if I want to follow the distal anatomic axis, it's going to poke out the lateral side of the tibia. So none of this is going to work. Self-evident, that's going to need correction. So we throw in an opening wedge osteotomy on the medial side of the tibia, straighten it out, and we can put it in bone straight up at like it belongs there, and it works out very, very well. So another just example going a slightly different direction. This is a 67 year old guy who's had a previous pilon fracture with this anterior sort of impaction pattern that you so commonly see with a little bit of varus. And you can see on the far right there that if I'm gonna to try to put an in bone with a stem into this, and I'd want to because his bone quality is pretty poor, um, it's gonna poke up the back of the tibia and that's not a great idea. So we do a two stage procedure here to do an opening wedge osteotomy again, this time from the front, realign the tibia, and ultimately now we get a chip shot in bone uh, operation. And you can see just how 
much more corrected his anatomy now is. His foot sits below his tibia, his tail, of course, is centered right below the, the tibial shaft where it should be on those lateral views. So this is a scenario where, again, tibial deformity in my hands generally needs to be corrected. So I'm going to just pause there for a second uh, because we're going to jump to kind of how did I get to this point. Um, I've sort of ran through that relatively quickly and uh, there may, I would expect there'd either be a lot of snoring or a lot of questions, but um, if there's any questions or anything, or if Hodges, if you had anything you want to jump in, this might be an opportunity to just change gears a little bit. Murray, yeah, I mean, you, you, the, the evolution is, um, is, is really interesting and I, and I look forward to that. Um, the, the case that you showed, you were concerned about the syndesmosis with the valgus, mm -hmm. most likely caused by global ankle instability. Um, you, you chose to do nothing to the syndesmosis. Interop, what makes you do something versus not? Because we all know that a syndesmotic fusion, those of us who did any agilities, which I know you did, a yeah. syndesmotic fusion is not an easy intraoperative decision to make. No, and so in that particular case, and I don't do this routinely, but if I have a suspicion around syndesmotic issues, I will go all the way laterally there, get my Howarth in there and look and see what sort of level of instability um, is there. And I will actually purposefully assess that intraoperatively. I think there's something to it. I, I know some of our colleagues don't really worry about it, so to speak. If you get good alignment, they say you don't have to worry about it. I still do in a valgus ankle. I really want to create that sort of lateral stability to minimize the risk of, of uh, the talus being dragged laterally. Um, I believe firmly that in most scenarios, the talus will follow the fibula. And if the fibula is allowed to deviate too far laterally, it's going to pull the talus that way as well. And so I'm going to fuse the, the uh, syndesmosis if, that, if I'm seeing that. So what I do is I stick a Howarth into this endosmosis and twist it. And if I can twist that Howarth, you know, kind of so that I can push the fibula and, it, and it's moving, that's the problem. I don't really care if it's wide. And in this particular case, it was a bit wide, but it was absolutely stuck there. There was no motion really at all. And so I left it alone. But it's more if it's unstable, more so than just being wide. That's what I'm looking for. And if you just put a couple of... Um, of suture buttons across there is that not enough than yeah. a fusion that hasn't been what i've done i just like you alluded to with the uh you know with agility that was a real problem getting those syndesmosis fusions uh they could they would go to non-union at times and so on what i do now is i i will take down the syndesmosis from the front very uh sort of very thoroughly get a burr in there uh, roughen up the bone surfaces quite you know over a ret over a length of probably three centimeters from the ankle on up the, the tibia and the fibula the nice thing is when you take your bony resections, you can morselize that into pretty good quality bone graft uh, because you're now looking for a fusion if you add some PDGF to that. So you've got a fusion mass that you can work with. I've had pretty good success in gaining fusion there when I need to. So I'll put a couple of screws through a plate so using a, uh, like a, um, a North lock type of plate that I'm using as a syndesmotic buttress, if you're sorry, as a fibular buttress to avoid the stress riser in the fibula and then crank it down pretty hard and then but then I'll have to keep them non-weight bearing which I don't really like to do for the total ankles but in those scenarios they're going to be now non-weight bearing and so far that's yielded pretty good fusion results but thank you it's been pretty rare. All right, All right guys Any, anybody else have uh, have questions? All right we'll have time on uh, later on so yeah. So I often get asked, you know, how did I get to this point? So I've been doing this, like I'd said before, for about 20 years. And, and uh, you know, if, if you, get, if you get to these places, as Hodges would attest to, you get here, you, you learn most of what you, what you know through failure. So I'm going to show you a bunch of that here now. But how did I get here? Well, um, I, it, was, it was pretty easy. The rest, my, my journey with ankle replacement started in a very easy place. I did my residency in the early 90s, and ankle arthritis was a fusion. And that was it. There was no such thing as ankle replacement uh, at that point in time. So it was a pretty easy skill to learn. You didn't have to. However, I did a fellowship in Adelaide in Australia in the late 90s. And that's where I was first exposed to ankle replacement. That was to the star ankle at that time. And uh, it didn't take long. And suddenly ankle replacement started to make some sense. At least it did to me at that time. Uh, so I came back to Canada in 1999 and started my practice. And the only available ankle replacement at that time was the agility. I did 10 of them and just abandoned it. It was a dismal experience for me and my patients. Uh, I had three of those 10 that actually were sort of semi-reasonable outcomes and the rest were not. 
And to me, that was the matter of if that's going to be anchor replacement, I have no interest in this. However, uh, around 2000, the star became available in Canada, and I was very happy to see that because that was something I was very familiar with. And so in 2000, I kind of like to think I became an anchor replacement surgeon in earnest. Uh, over the next, uh, between three and four years, it was, uh, I did 50 star primaries, uh, and uh, Tim Daniels and I got together and uh, uh, Put our results together and published this in JBJS about five years ago, looking at our first 50 cases with a mean of nine years of follow-up. And you can see there that there was, you, know, you, can, you can interpret this however you like, the results could be okay, but 12% failure at less than 10 years average and 18% uh, polyethylene failure was a big problem for both of us. We really were unhappy with that and that kind of got us looking for something else. So why did I stop using the star? With all the poly issues were big among them, but really even more important than the poly fractures and failures was the combination of that and the osteolysis that we were seeing. We just saw enormous amounts of this. Literally almost every patient had these large ballooning cysts. And uh, they would, you know, you'd wind up in these scenarios where patients had virtually no bone stock left when they'd fail. And this was really difficult. You'd feel like you did a really good operation. It worked out pretty well for a while. And then you'd wind up in this scenario and that was very disheartening. Nevertheless, a lot of good lessons were learned uh, in my experience for sure. And that is that, uh, you know, there's, there's always something you can take away from a failure. And so we're going to just talk about these in a bit. One of them is subtalar fusion. So I thought subtalar fusion was a good option uh, to do with ankle replacement. I still do in some scenarios, but here's an example patient with a significant plane of valgus foot below end stage ankle arthritis. I thought I can make this look really good. So we go ahead and do a big flat foot reconstruction all in one stage, the star ankle and a distraction, subtalar fusion, and a whole midfoot realignment. It looks fantastic. So here we are, you know, high-fiving. This is all great. But here we are two years later, later and things are not great, not even close. Osteolysis, subsidence, and a lot of pain. When we CT him, we can see that the subtalar joint did indeed fuse, but the talus completely collapsed, almost certainly from AVN, from me dissecting out the talus so much to get that degree of correction and so on. And that's just, uh, that was a real hard lesson to learn. I become a, became a lot less liberal with subtalar fusion. When I do subtalar fusion, which I still do uh, simultaneously, I just do an isolated posterior facet. I leave the sinus, sinus tarsi alone. And that's worked out okay, but it really did, it was a word of caution and this guy wound up with a TTC fusion. I also learned that, con that gutter pain is a very complex problem, particularly in mobile bearing ankle replacements. And this case was really instructive in that. This is a guy who's three years out from his star ankle and ever since he had, he was never really that happy, always had persistent medial ankle pain. You can see all the heterotopic bone there. And so here he is, he, I, after a while, I talked me into doing something. So we did an arthroscopic gutter debridement. and I thought I did a pretty good job of removing all that bone there arthroscopically. I thought that was gonna fix the problem, but not really. He, uh, he looks a little better on x-ray, but he was still significantly painful. We watched him for quite a while. He did not want more surgery. He was never really happy. I think he just preferred to come and complain uh, to me in, in, a, in a deserving way, I think. Uh, but here he is at four years out from that scope, now five, and you can see the bone coming back in earnest here. And he's really got an almost captured ankle here. So I thought, okay, well, we can fix this. And he was at the point where he wanted something done. So at seven years post scope and 10 years post total ankle, we took him back for a pretty aggressive open debridement, poly exchange, grafting of cysts. And what you can see here is you can think, well, man, I did a really good job. I cleared this thing out. There's all kinds of room here now, except what's obvious is that the talus has now taken advantage of that and shifted over, moved to kind of where it wanted to go. And he, was, he sort of tried to be honest with me. I sort of told me, yeah, I think I might be a little bit better with this, but he really wasn't. And things just gradually got worse. And you can start to see what's happening here because we've now freed him up. His biomechanics are no longer correct. He's malaligned and it's getting a bit worse. And now he's much more painful as things start to get some osteolysis from poly edge wearing and likely some subsidence of this tibial component there medially. And this is what I learned is that, that the mobile bearing, it's all fine and good for it to be able to float around and find its, its home base, but sometimes it won't float to the right place. And that doesn't leave you in a good situation and it allows the gutters, you wind up with this pain because the, the, the talus will abut against the malleoli no matter what you do, if it's not in the right place. And there's gonna be more coming on this topic in just a few slides. I also learned that valgus and deltoid insufficiency was 
really risky. And what I said to you before about how I practice around valgus ankle stems a lot from this case, uh, but then others like it as well. So it's a 59 year old GP, a colleague in my area, he had bilateral valgus ankle arthritis. This was in my first year of, of doing STARS that he came along. I remember going to the AOFS meeting and showing these x-rays to all of my really esteemed senior colleagues, all of whom said, oh yeah, yeah, go ahead, I'll be fine. Just go ahead and pop a total ankle in there, no problem. So that's what I did. I put a total ankle in his right side. He liked it. So I put one in his left side and everything was going along swimmingly for a short period of time. Um, he kind of disappeared for a while, came back four years later looking like this. Uh, was complete and utter failure. And when I went back and operated on this, the, this deltoid ligaments were basically cottage cheese bilaterally. Um, there was really nothing there at all. And that really uh, when he awarded me off of pursuing valgus and deltoid insufficient ankles for a very long time. So he wound up with bilateral TTC fusions as a result. And then there's the other, I'd sort of said, well, valgus is bad, but I'm pretty happy with varus. So even early on in my practice, I sort of thought, hey, I can, I can handle varus pretty well. So I did and took on some pretty nasty looking cases. And one was this Z deformity, which I didn't really have the respect for at that time that I probably should have. So this is a patient with a varus ankle, but a plano valgus foot below it. Uh, these are complex deformities. And they have really challenging biomechanics and it's really important to figure out and un understand them and unwind the deformity fully if you want to get any success. So here's this patient. You can see she's got both kind of funny looking feet, but her left one is significantly worse. And she's got this varus tibial plafond with an even worse varus uh, tailor tilt below it. She's got some significant hind foot arthritis, but she's also got this funky midfoot. And we're going to show you that here. So to, to help understand, this is actually her contralateral side, which is less severe because it's, it's easier to understand the deformity when you look at the less severe side. So she's got this very varus hind foot and ankle. You can see the talus completely overlaps the calcaneus, but because of the morphology of her tailor head and neck, it's driven her uh, medial column very far medially. And then she's shortened it laterally and she's gotten this abducted flat foot appearance. In these ankles, these Z foot, their Z ankle deformities, they all have in common the smeared medial malleolar appearance. If you see this, you should be really wary about this ankle. This is not the standard thing. So what did I do with her? Well, this was back in 2003. Uh, I sort of thought, I think I know what I'm doing with this. So I took her to the OR for a two-stage procedure, did an open ankle release, uh, midfoot uh, osteotomy with a medial closing wedge. Uh, and uh, a slightly plantar closing wedge as well to try to recreate her arch and rotate it around to the triple arthrodesis to complete that. So I thought I was pretty good there. And then a few months later, we took her to the OR and did a star ankle and a modified Evans lateral ligament reconstruction. I thought everything had gone well, as you can see her old crappy x-rays here. And it didn't take very long and she'd had some recurrence of this varus deformity. And I thought, oh, how did that happen? I couldn't quite figure it out, but I took her back to the OR and did a lateralizing calcaneal osteotomy. That seemed like a reasonable thing to do. Did some toe work at the same time. But not surprisingly, even though I thought it looked good in the OR, it didn't take very much longer after that. Another, not even, you know, not a little over half a year. And she was having this recurrent varus yet again. You can see the polyethylene being ejected into the fibula there. That's clearly not a good scenario. And so I did a, what took her back again and said, I got it, this, this, this medial side's the problem. I did this medial release redid the lateral ligament reconstruction, thought, fine, I've got this thing really sturdy. However, that didn't even really last two years and she developed this very severe varus, ejected the poly and I felt I had to go and revise this. So I revised her uh, tailor component, the tibial was still solid and there were no real good revision imp uh, imp implants available at all around that time. Uh, and so she wound up getting, a, I had adopted Hintegra by that point in time. So I put a Hintegra tailor component and I had to cut it very low like you see here. Because of that degree of uh, bone loss, uh, she needed this extra thick polyethylene. There was no such thing. So she wound up getting, I put in two uh, nine millimeter spacers stacked on top of each other and that little metal plate's holding the top one in place. And that was a temporizing move until I could get an a custom made uh, 18 millimeter poly that I put in in the second stage of a revision, which is what you see here. And that all did okay. I was a bit surprised in a way that she did. Unfortunately, she it was a very lovely woman, but she passed away a few years ago. She died 12 years post revision, and she was actually very happy with this. And that stayed like this. These are the x-rays from shortly, well, about a year before she passed away. 
but she's still got this residual foot deformity. It took till quite some time afterward that I really figured out where my errors were here. And what you realize when you see over here on the left-hand side, you can see the center line of her talus really should be pointing at about the 1-2 interspace, and it's not. I left her foot way immediately translated. And what that did is it placed that center of forefoot loading. Every time she stood on her toes, she had this medial forefoot load causing this rotational moment around her uh, axis or around the ankle axis driving it into varus and fortunately this was a robust enough construction that it put up with that for quite a long time but that was a real learning uh, situation and she i clearly did not correct the foot to the level it needed to be because i didn't understand it well enough back in those days so caution around the z deformity is really what i'm trying to tell you I also learned with the stars that ankle replacements in young patients can be okay. So contrasting to what I told you before, he's a 45 year old guy with bilateral ankle arthritis. He's got spontaneously fused feet. Uh, so nothing moves other than his ankle jiggles a little bit. And here he is now 16 years post-op from two stars that are still working out very well for him. And uh, he's 61 years old now and still going strong. So hopefully this is gonna carry on for a good long time. He's clearly a low demand guy. He probably weighs about a hundred pounds and he's about five feet tall, if that. And so in some scenarios, you can get it very young. So in 2004 though, I moved on. I'd had enough of the star and uh, Wright Medical, this is kind of interesting twist. Wright Medical uh, was the North American distributor for uh, New Deal who owned the uh, Hintegra ankle. So Wright Medical brought Beat Hinderman and Bruce Cohn, who I hope you recognize to Vancouver to demonstrate the Hintegra. Bruce had actually never done one. Uh, and uh, Biet's description of his journey uh, really emulated mine uh, with the star ankle. And he and I actually became quite good friends uh, around this time uh, as we kind of worked uh, a lot of, or worked through a lot of the same problems. And I was convinced to change. Uh, his other colleague, Victor Valderavano, who also became a good friend of mine, he was then doing a PhD in Calgary. So he came to Vancouver to assist me with my first two Hintegras. And uh, this is my experience. I did uh, 240 Hintergras uh, with a much improved revision rate. I was actually quite happy in general, and that's why I stuck with it for quite a long time. But there were still big concerns. And osteolysis, again, was a big part of this. Uh, thin poly, mobile bearings, persistent pain in the gutters, an unnecessarily complicated procedure around the talus with poor instrumentation. And so my lessons were difficult. This is a patient of mine. He's a neighbor and a good friend. Uh, he had this Hintegra done at five years, was doing very, very well, but he had this osteolysis. He didn't want to have further surgery. Didn't take long though, when he had sudden acute onset of pain as his talus fell into the sinkhole that was created below it. And this was revised to an in-bone too. And that got me to the point that with those kind of cases, I had many of these and the in-bones were always there to salvage them. I became a real big fan of of inbone, and that's uh, where my shift to that began. Come back to that in a second. And uh, I learned a few other lessons from the Integra era. Mobile bearing pain was one of them. And so this is a 64 year old patient, two years post-op. She always had this persistent gutter pain, much like that patient with a star that I was telling you about, despite excellent looking x-rays though. So she didn't have all that heterotopic bone. Nevertheless, she was having trouble. So I figured, well, I'll take her back and do an arthroscopic gutter debridement, but she just got worse. It was only after I finally took her back for an open debridement that the light came on. If you look at what's happening in here, the way that that talus is moving, that is nowhere near normal mechanics. And the light came on, and when you look closely now at the spec scan, you can see the paint, the, the, the area that's lighting up, particularly medially, is not the gutter at all. It's the medial malleolus. And what's happening here, and what happens with these mobile bearings that are actually working really well, is they develop malleolar stress pain. It's like a stress fracture in situ, and it's the more you free them up, the worse they get. And that was a real disappointment. It's always frustrating when you do an operation that you think looks good and should be good and just isn't. And when the, when the uh, design lets you down. The other thing I learned though is be very vigilant, especially with the talus. Uh, this is a very similar case to what I just showed you before. Another good patient of mine, osteolysis in the talus, solidly bonded in the front and one day just suddenly got worse when his pegs snapped off on this cantilever diving board over the pool in the back of the talus here. And you can see those pegs snap right off here on the right hand side and they're stuck inside the talus there. We had to dig those out in order to do this revision. So that led me to a point where I felt I needed to move on. And there was uh, you know, sort of serendipitously through my long ties with the Wright Medical in Canada through the Integra, 
and me pestering them all the time to, for better ankle replacement, together with Wright's acquisition of InBone, which I had developed a bit of a love affair with in a, in a brief way, that led to a confluence of uh, good events. And I, together with Hodges and uh, five other surgeons, were able to come together to form Wright's total ankle development team back in those days. And you'll notice the picture of the Wright logo looks quite different uh, back then. That's uh, over 10 years ago now. And that leads us to where we are now. And we, we've been able to develop some pretty impressive, uh, uh, I think a pretty impressive array of devices that help us cover the continuum of care and get us to where I showed or talked to you about at the very beginning of where I am now with ankle replacement. And so it's been a long journey, 20 years that it's hard to encapsulate in a short uh, talk like this, but that's where we are. And I think I'm gonna jump now into some cases for discussion. We've got uh, about 15 minutes or so to do that. So hopefully we can get through some of these, but I'll pause there and uh, open it up for some questions if there are any. Uh, Murray. Huh. Where's Avery, I wonder? Murray Hodges. Huh. Uh, okay, I'll sit over Adam, here then. Adam, you want to start first? You have you have a question? Okay. Um, Murray, um, you, you talked about uh, the Z foot. Um, more and more, I hear people calling that the ping pong ankle. I can't remember if that's Steve or Tim Daniels deal, yeah. but, but like long, what's that? It sounds like a Timism. Yeah. So longstanding Varus, um, they have a valgus foot and, and you've got to do something about it. And, uh, and I think that this is, something that we've all discovered is is that just fixing uh the uh the foot the ankle it only gives you um you're only halfway there which is the reason why we're we're doing a lot of these in two stages but um have you have you found in the in the two-part ankle um that doing this kind of big uh deformity you have much more confidence in it or do you, or do you feel like um, two part, three part, it almost doesn't matter. So that, that's clearly a guiding question, but I think you're absolutely right. The, the, I, uh, I went from being an absolute, uh, you know, fist, as you well know, in those meetings, you know, early on pounding my fist on the table, it's got, we've got to have a mobile bearing option. And, uh, I think, thank God, uh, I was surrounded by smarter people than me. And, uh, I think that's just a flawed uh, concept and in these cases in particular the stability that you can gain through a well-designed uh, sulcus articulation or as an articulation that provides some level of inherent stability uh, but still accommodates uh, potential off-axis forces is just way more forgiving around these very complicated ankles and so uh, you know in bone for me has been a just a game changer uh, for these very these very cases, and actually that's what I just threw up here. This very first case just happens to be a Z deformity case, um, and I think that it's you know the the stability that you gain from having a, a fixed bearing two part type of ankle, but with it's not just that it's the geometry of the articulation that matters as well. So I think I'd have a lot less confidence say within bone one in this scenario, not because of the bone implant interface, but because that saddle design did not impart quite the amount of stability that I would have wanted to see um, in some of these kind of cases. But the, the and, and again, you can see there's a convergence, you know, I guess uh, um, what's the imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, right? So I think you can sort of see that that's the, the that, that has borne out to be a, a, an articular geometry that does, that, that works. And, well, you remember, you remember years ago um, that, what we did first in our with the design team is is converted in bone one to in bone two with the tail articular geometry. Um, you showed a couple of uh, pictures on the long tail or stem. Just a quick comment on the long tail or stem before you, because I because I, I think this is a great case that illustrates so much of what you were talking about. Yeah. So the long stem tailor component again. We and I, I think I can impugn you in this too. I think. All of us, I think, initially thought that was a really good um, option for uh, you know salvaging the complex Taylor failures, and uh, I think all of us were disheartened when the FDA uh, you know, pulled the approval of use of that. It wasn't 
it was it always remained available to us in Canada, so I used it a handful of times. And as it turns out, it, you know, this is one scenario where the FDA was certainly right. Uh, the we saw some tremendous failures related to that long stem. Um, some of them, you've, I think Mike Braggy's got some wonderful pictures of trying to pound a long stem out of the out of the foot. Not necessarily that one, but it's one of the ways that it causes grief by you know really binding to bone heavily. But the biggest issue is that it bonds to bone and then stress shields the talus and the talus just melts away underneath the talus component. And that's something that we, we don't want. We want load sharing devices, not load carrying devices. And, and the long stem and the talus has proven to be not the right step uh, in that way. Yeah, my experience in the four long stems that we were able to place before the FDA shut those down, 100% uh, of them um, failed, the talus failed with stress shielding. and. Um, and so, yeah, we were, we were frustrated. We almost sent right down the IDE. You remember that discussion? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you got to do it. You got to do yeah. it. And that would have been a, a, a phenomenal waste of resources. All right. Any, any other questions, guys? Uh, nobody? Okay. Well, let's keep going and we'll be looking for questions. If you do have a question, either, either, um, chime in or you can raise your hand um which is there's something on this that you can raise your hand but uh, but it's down at the bottom of your participants list and you go raise your hand like i'm doing it for myself right now all yeah. right and i'd also right, say Martin. feel free uh, for all of you uh, feel free to unmute yourselves if you just want to jump in with a question as we this is now case discussion time it's a little less uh formal hopefully you won't feel like you're being uh, preached at quite as much uh, but this is a this is an example of a Z deformity case, but a much less severe one than what I just showed you. But it sort of illustrates my current approach to this now. So this is a 75 year old uh, woman. She's had severe ankle pain for quite some time. She's got this significant varus on her left. And when you look at her, I don't have a photo, unfortunately, of her hind to lung. She's in clear varus uh, on stance. She's got this. You can see on this AP view that I've drawn the red lines there that she's trying hard to compensate into valgus through her subtalar joint, but really can't get all the way there. But more notably on the lateral view, she's got these weird bilateral uh, collapsed, uh, you know, NC level uh, midfoot breaks. You could argue that maybe this represented a, a cable varus uh, foot that collapsed through bone, but she tells me that she's had flat feet her whole life. So she, did, I, I asked her in many different ways, you know, were you a high arch person ever at one time? She said, absolutely not, never, never, never. So nevertheless, so she's got this you know, developmental foot alignment that puts her ankle into varus, her hind foot into some degree of compensatory valgus, and then with this midfoot driven plane of valgus deformity. And the question is, you know, how are you going to approach this now? You can kind of imagine looking at these x-rays here, if you twist the talus to be neutral to the mechanical axis, where is the foot going to go? And what are you going to have to do to the foot? And Again, if, if anybody wants to ask a question or jump in or maybe offer some input as to what they would do in this scenario, by all means, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are as a group. And uh, that being said, if nobody... Well, you know, Murray, the, the difficult... Yeah, the difficult thing about these is what do you do first? Because you know the foot's going to be an issue. In Varus, I think it's often easier to do the ankle first because it gets you straight, but you know you're going to have to do some kind of variant of, uh, of a fusion or an osteotomy in the, in the navicular cuneiform and or in the, uh, in the Lisfranc's joint. Um, and yeah, and, and this, these are a little hard. Typically with varus, I like doing the ankle first and then, and then dealing with the other, but this might be one I might stage and get the varus corrected and then pin it and then fix the foot and mm -hmm. then and then put some cement and, and then come back and do the uh the foot later but i also think this is probably one um that i probably could do in one stage depending on uh, I'd, I'd look at the cat scan and some other things yeah, and you know when i look at this so based on my sort of evolution through these uh, with varus angle, with, with the more typical varus, if it's a if it's a really severe one, I'm sure you're going to see the next case with a cable varus type of foot. Those ones I will plan to do in two stages, but there I'll commonly do the foot first with realigning the ankle as part of that first stage, but not putting the total ankle in. 
then doing the foot. And the reason I do it that way is just because the, it gets there, the, the fusion part of the surgery is where they're gonna have to be non-weight bearing and minimally active. When I put their total ankle in, I want them weight bearing and moving quickly to get their, to maximize their ankle function. So I want that to be hopefully an isolated procedure and I want them to be ready to go. So I try to do their foot first. And so in most varus, stiff typical varus, that's kind of how, if, if I need to do it in two stages at all, which you don't so commonly have to, but if I do, then I try to do the foot first. Um, but in this particular scenario, if I see a Z deforming like this, these all get done ankle first. And you'll see why in this particular case. So the reason though being that I don't know what I'm gonna to do to the foot until the ankle is straight. And I just tell the patients, look, it's gonna be a longer recovery for you in this way because I, I can't do your foot until I know where your ankle is gonna be and how well your total ankle is gonna function. So this is just another view of her x-rays here, a bit more comprehensive view of everything here. She's also got some subtalar arthritis there from all that long time compensation. This is the prophecy plan. And the one thing I'm gonna highlight here and draw everybody's attention to up in the upper right-hand side, I'm gonna circle it there with my mouse. You can just see to get the talus where it needs to go, how much of the fibula is in the way. And if there's anything that I can leave you with is varus ankle correction has almost nothing to do with what you do on the medial side of the ankle. And Hodges will laugh because I used to be all about medial malleolar osteotomies and everything on the medial side. It's all about what you do here. This I've already will, forgotten that, that stage that you went yeah, through. But you really, if you fix this, if you get the, if you create space for the talus to move into by getting rid of the fibula there, as I'm drawing it there, just follow that in boner section right down, it'll just fall into place nine times out of 10. So that's what was done here. It's a bit oblique, so you can't quite see, but the cut does go right down like that. And here she is after stage one, and you can see that I haven't really done much else. But funnily enough, I had her all teed up to go for stage two and she absolutely refused. She said, no, I love my ankle, I love my foot. I can't figure out why her foot works, um, but it looks, compared to her pre-op pictures, I guess there was more flexibility there than I appreciated. And so she's now, it's actually this, this slide deck's a couple of years old, so it's about five years out now, she looks like this and is still going strong. So I've never been able to talk her into a stage two uh, procedure yet. But this is why I think when you see the Z deformities, one of the other reasons to think about the ankle first. So look for that smeared ankle on the medial malleolus, look for the funky foot position, and then think about doing the ankle first. That would be my two bits. After. And Murray, in, yeah. in the other part of North America, we call that charcoal, but it's fine. <laughs> uh, J Jason, do you have a do you have a question? I, I see your uh, yeah. You're unmuted yourself. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Thank you. I have two questions. Number one, uh, do you do you pay attention at all to? Uh, I mean, this this cable varus may not have had it, but when they when they have a severe external external rotation deformity, and the fibula is way posterior. Um, mm -hmm. What what do you what do you do with that? I, I had one recently where they where the prophecy put the rotation at about 55 degrees. And I think I even sent it to Hodges and he responded back, but <clears throat> what do you, what, how, how do you deal with that rotation? Yeah, so uh, I'll answer that question, but I'll, then I'll sort of show you as well, because this case that's just that popped up on the screen is exactly that. Um, so the, the, the classic cable varus foot, kind of like you see on the screen here, is typically associated with external tibial torsion that's quite considerable. And I don't think you can really address that through the ankle joint per se. Uh, ever so slightly you can, but not, not mostly. And if it's bad enough, so it, what, what I will do is I will make the foot, and this is a, this, I kind of learned this uh, by spending some time in Germany uh, and uh, with a guy who cracks some of the most twisted up feet that I'd ever seen was Wolfram Wentz, who's a friend of Hodges and mine. And uh, he would twi untwist these just remarkable pretzeled feet. And it was, that was there when I sort of saw this done. When you really straighten out these cable varus feet, yeah, they point, the, the, the actual foot is typically lying in 60 to 75 degrees of external rotation once you finally get the foot straight to the ankle. The catch then is that the ankle needs to be made straight to the knee. And so he would routinely just very, in a very typical kind of German surgeon fashion, very quickly uh, just cut the tibia transversely and rotate it 50 degrees internally and then fix it with K wires and wait for it to heal. 
I haven't done that myself. That's a little bold, but I will do rotational. I, I don't have it in this slide deck, uh, but I will do rotational tibial osteotomies to, uh, to, to bring the, and the fibula, of course, with it, um, to point the ankle in line, in the appropriate alignment with the knee, and then adjust the foot below it. So, and, that, and saying it that way is wrong. I'll always do the foot and ankle reconstruction first. And if the foot is then left in massive external rotation, then I'll go back and do a tibial osteotomy to straighten that out. Um, and so I won't try to overly correct that through the, um, through the, the ankle replacement. I'm going to follow the anatomy that's there and then correct above it if I need to. I hope that's sort of clear. Yeah, my, my, my experience is you just really need to be sure when you're doing your tibial resection that you that you don't get thrown into too much external rotation. And that, with prophecy, that that can happen with this. In particular, um, if if the fibula is so posterior translated, once you get the tibia right, the talus typically will um, will come around and. Um, and so, so that, I, I mean, that's how I, I fix that, it, at least try to fix it. Uh, so Props you, can help. Yeah, I encourage you to look at this view. So on this picture here, this is back to that Z case just to illustrate. Um, it's not just the, the rotation of the, uh, the what, what prophecy can do or where prophecy can kind of mess you up is in this gutter bisection angle that they create. So if the fibula is truly lying far posterior, but not only that, it's actually externally rotated relative to the plafond, then you'll get a very wide gutter angle. So in this one, you can see is 7.8 degrees, and I've purposely chosen to internally rotate the tailor or the tibial component. Like I said, I don't, there's only, a, there's a limit to how much rotation you can correct here. I, I'm trying to correct a little bit here. But there are some of them where there's like a 25 degree angle here and you split it to be 12 degrees. Well, that's going to make it way too externally rotated. I get very nervous if this area here, and I'm sort of, hopefully you can see my mouse there where the 2.0 is at the bottom center. I get very nervous if that number is above five degrees. Uh, if, if, my ax, if my tibial component is going to be pointing more than five degrees external to the medial gutter line, I get nervous. And so I think that sort of speaks to what you're talking a bit about there is that the, if this anatomy and this view looks like a normal uh, ankle, then the relationship of this to the proximal tibia, that's tibial torsion. And then uh, and Andy Goldberg's recent paper really showed that pretty well. And you can't correct this tibial torsion that you see here at the ankle that you, that you either, you either accept it or you leave, or you correct the tibia. But if what you're talking about is the gutter bisection angle pushing your implant very externally rotated, yes, that I would correct through the ankle. I hope, I hope that, I hope I'm being clear there. To me, of course, I'm clear, but I'm not sure that it comes across clear to anybody else. But there's two different ways you can wind up with ex excessive external rotation. One is through tibial torsion, one is through gutter bisection problems. The gutter bisection problems you can solve at the ankle level, the tibial torsion you can. I hope that's relatively clear. Um, we'll jump ahead a little bit here. By all means, they'll jump in uh, with other questions and things. That, that's fantastic. So, um, so here's a different style of varus. This is the more typical kind of varus case. So a severe cable varus foot below a varus ankle. Uh, much more typical, though complicated, way less complicated than a Z foot. <clears throat> And so the question is, you know, what do I do here? Well, when you look at the deformity, these are the things that need to be undone. So this is going to get a dorsolateral closing wedge osteotomy with derotation of the foot. Um, and uh, that's done through a big, it's sort of not a, a modestly sized lateral uh, approach to the, to the foot. And uh, this was done in two stages. So in the first stage, we're going to do that osteotomy. We're going to realign the ankle. I pinned this one straight. I've tried using the cement technique that Steve talks about. Uh, never. Uh, not been quite as happy with that as just simply pinning it. So I just do this now and, uh, and then doing this midfoot and hindfoot fusion. And then we were going to do a little bit of toe work if we needed to down the road. So we got them aligned here and that just set us up for a nice straightforward in bone total ankle. And when you rotate the leg correctly, you can see that the ankle itself is actually perfectly normal. It's just externally rotated relative to the knee. 
And so we've cleared out his lateral gutter, like I talked about, making the correction of the varus very easy. I didn't have to really do much of anything medially other than just the usual cleanup and a little bit of medial deltoid release. And here he is now a year out and very happy plantigrade foot. And you can see I've got a very mortis ankle x-ray here to, to get an AP of the implant. Uh, but that's again because of his tibial torsion. But when they account for that on the x-rays, you can see a very nice normal looking fibular position in relation to the ankle and foot. And that's so I didn't go back and do a tibial osteotomy here, a derotation osteotomy of the tibia because his foot position, once I'd taken the huge wedge out of his foot, uh, looked okay. And I think I have a, I'm not sure if I have an AP. This, this AP sort of shows you that the tail, if you look down the line of the talus now, I'm pointing at his first ray, like you should be here. And when you get it that straight, then, then you can kind of get the foot into the right alignment to the tibia. And so this is to my, in my hands, this is always done in two stages, Hodges. I don't know, do you do these in two or do you do them in one? Uh, no, I, I do them in, uh, I do them in uh, most of the time in two. If I'm gonna do a triple, I'm gonna do them in two. Yeah. Uh, the the only thing that I will tell you is that if I do this much work to the talus, um, I am I I am looking very very critically at the CAT scan, and very often I will use an Envision talus on these. Um, I use it more for valgus, but uh, but I, I I do use it for varus, and so so I'll do a CAT scan, and and if there's any AVN looking stuff at the um, at at the most superior portion, then I will I will get the prophecy scan to take three more millimeters off, and I'll put an envision um, yeah. component in. Yeah, and I, I like that too. In this case, I felt I had pretty good bone there, and so it I looks great. Work, yeah, work through that thought process as well. You can see I added in a little dorsiflexion first ray osteotomy just to ensure that I got his four foot uh, plantigrade here at the time of the of the, uh, of the end bone. All right, so Murray, you got uh, you got time for one. Okay. Your options are osteolysis, valgus, or a fusion takedown. Why don't we not do the fusion takedown because that's going to be um, a topic for later. Sure. And I I think the osteolysis case is a is an awesome case. Yeah, I think um, we can talk a bit about that. You're going to, yeah. I think there's, as you said, there's going to be complex primary discussion uh, in other sessions too. So. Uh, the valgus case can wait. Um, yeah, so this is actually a pretty, it's a fairly short and straightforward case. 88 year old the woman who had her ankle done in Ontario uh, by a, a friend that had a good job, had a great outcome, no symptoms, very happy. She was just sent along to me just for routine follow ups. The first time I ever saw her at six years post op, this is what her x rays looked like. And you can see there's some osteolysis there underneath the talus. I, I let her know that I was a bit concerned about that, but she was 88 and I was like, well, I think we're just gonna kind of leave you alone. And she was very happy with being left alone. However, I told her, yeah, you should come back. So she came back now 90 years old and uh, two years later, and you can see that might've been a bit of a mistake. Her talus now is almost an eggshell. Her osteolytic lesion is now much larger. Uh, on CT scan here, you can see it's going to just sort of move through there, and you can see it's occupying a very large portion of her medial Taylor head and neck and Taylor body. And uh, that was a question. She was still completely symptom free. Based on my experience, though, I showed you before, leaving these patients uh, with a sinkhole below their Taylor component was uh, just didn't feel right to me. And you have to ask yourself, you know, as a surgeon, what would you do here? A completely asymptomatic, otherwise pretty healthy 90 year old woman. Uh, who's eight years post tar and she's got that, what would you do? So I thought long and hard about it. Did I really want to go and mine out her pelvis or her agria, her femur, it probably wouldn't be any bone in there anyway. Fill it with allograft chips that may or may not osteointegrate. And we thought about it, I talked to a few people, including Hodges, and sort of came to the conclusion that I would do something that I actually don't commonly do because I almost always want to bone graft these. But here's what I did, I put in a whole bunch of pro dense and uh, filled that space right up. And here she is, I think this is only six weeks out. I, I do have a later x-ray, I couldn't dig it up in time for this, uh, this presentation, but most of that has visibly resorbed now um, on the last x-rays that I have. And she's remained entirely symptom-free through the whole thing. So I, I haven't re-CT'd her to really know if that turned into any degree of bone or whether it just 
reabsorbed and turned into nothing. Um, it definitely doesn't look completely like normal talus yet. But so far, um, she hasn't fallen into the cavern. Uh, she's now uh, about 91 years old, because that was about a year ago I did this, and, um, and seemingly doing okay. And for me, that seemed like a reasonable salvage, but it opens up the question, you know, what do you do when you see these massive osteolytic lesions? We did change her poly at the time too, and just by way of interest, finding um, in bone one poly, <laughs> not an easy thing to do, um, but we did find some and that uh, we were able to put that in there. And so hopefully this will carry her for the rest of her, of her life and we'll see how we go. But be curious yeah, you to know, your comments. Audrey. Murray, it's, oh. you know, we have about, uh, about 60 M bone ones and, uh, and we've seen this on the M bone ones. It, it was, we've seen it occasionally on the M bone twos, but, but much less common. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I do believe that it has something to do with the, uh, with the inherent instability with the saddle design. Um, and the polys, when you take them out, they look, um, they look not what you would hope. And, yeah. uh, so I always hope that the, um, that the talus is loose so I can at least put a talus in before I build up below, um, <laughs> either way. And then you can use end bone too. Um, but, but I think this is, this is a great solution for a, for a really difficult problem. Yeah, and you know, I like I said, I wish I did have a CT scan to check on how she's been doing. It's pretty hard to justify doing that in a truly asymptomatic ninety-year-old woman. <laughs> but uh, but it would be interesting to see just how much of that's actually been uh, turned into bone versus just you know kind of turned into more reinforcement. Maybe you know maybe the surrounding bones just become more sclerotic and supportive. I'm not sure, but. Um, and either way, it's been a pretty good salvage for her. And I think I'd throw that out there as at least an option to consider <clears throat> for anybody else who's looking at a similar kind of case. Beautiful. Well, um, I, I think that that is, uh, that is great. I'm, I'm telling you that the nuggets in your presentation, uh, Murray, always um, make me um, love to, to hear you. Any, any questions at all from, from the group? Um, yeah, hopefully right. we haven't put everybody to sleep. No, well, um, uh, so Nate, I might get you to finish up and talk about um, about the next um, program and who's going to be there. And uh, and um, guys, remember, um, you have my email address. If anybody's got questions, please send me an email, and uh, and our our group can give you Murray's email address also. Yeah. Yep. So um, moving forward, we, we want this to be a collaborative, um, um, open uh, discourse. So Nate? Yes, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Penner, again. That was a fantastic talk. Really appreciate your time with everyone this evening. And, and just for the, uh, the group on here, uh, as Dr. Davis mentioned, so the next step is for us is gonna be uh, sort of the part two on our uh, primary uh, series of uh, webinars. That's gonna be in uh, early October is what we're gonna be shooting for. We're still trying to nail down faculty for that. So as soon as we have those details, we'll, we'll get that out to all of you. So just keep an eye out for uh, communication on that. And uh, again, thank you all for joining us this evening. Really appreciate your time and uh, you all have a great evening and a great rest of the week. Thank you.